Well, we've been in a series entitled No Limits, and uh, I think part of why I ended up going with this thought process is because I'm a pretty practical kind of guy, and I like to live in the framework that makes me comfortable. (laughs) And I've discovered that serving God, that doesn't work so well. You know, he wants us to live not within our own abilities, but he wants us to live within his. And uh, we started off the first week talking about let God use you. And uh, I shared with you about how God uses young people. He just, he just did. You just witnessed that, which is wonderful. And I talked about how God uses women because it blows my mind how many people want to limit what God can and wants to do in and through a surrendered life. But then I talked about how God uses flawed people, which now that just stretches out to all of us and includes every one of us, because there's no perfect person. So if God only used perfect people, then nothing would be accomplished through people. He uses flawed people. The Bible is full of them, right? But now he doesn't magnify their flaws, he magnifies his spirit in people's lives and through people's lives. And when we're submitted to him, he can do something. But I thought I should maybe bring a little clarity because as I was talking about this last week, I thought, you know, some people might not catch this fully. Just because God uses you or just because God uses a person, I want you to understand that's not his stamp of approval on everything in your life. I'm just throwing that out there. I just said God uses flawed people, and there's no perfect people, but just because God does something in you and God does something through you, that does not mean that you've arrived. That does not mean that you have to keep growing and changing, allowing him to do a work in you. All right? Because I just, I don't know, I thought that was important, but I want to bring the scripture up again, Galatians 3, 26 through 29. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, having clothed yourself with Christ. It's like we're all in him. This was the example I used. This represents him. All of us, every one of us are in him. We're surrounded by him. The blood of Jesus covers, washes over us, right? And verse 28 says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And verse 29 says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and you are heirs according to the promise. We are all co-heirs. And none of us get more than any other one in Christ. It's a level playing field. And that's so important to understand. So important to understand. And so I kicked off last week talking about the measuring stick mindset. And I was kind of talking to myself because it's amazing how much we want to take things and fit them into how good or bad it is. And we measure everything. I talked about, first of all, don't limit the messenger. In other words, don't try and stop who can speak into your life. It's about having an open heart. God, I want to hear your voice. Whether it's creation calling, whether it's you sending a person, whether it's me opening the Bible and a word jumps out to me, God, I want to hear your voice. So don't limit how God can speak to you. And then I talked about don't be limited by what you have, and so many people do this. We're like, you know, I don't really have a lot of talents. I'm like right here or right here. And so God, this is is the limit. If I really stretch myself, this is as far as I can go. And God's saying, get rid of that measuring mind stick. It's the wrong mindset. There's so much more that he wants to do. And don't be limited by your past experiences. I'm just going to be noisy and drop things because it's what it is. But then finally, it's so important also as you go through this process of just getting rid of all the limits and understanding that in Christ we are all, we are all equal and he can do something in us to not try and measure then what true success is. Because true success is just simply obedience. That's all it is. If you do whatever it is 
that God's calling you to do. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. It doesn't matter what's going on in, in your friend's world, in your neighbor's world, or what they're doing for God. It's just about you. What are you doing that God's asking you to do? And if you are walking out in obedience, whether you think it's big or whether you think it's little, is irrelevant. That's not, that's not the measuring stick. The simple measuring stick is, are you saying yes to God? Simple obedience. So that brings us to today. And I kind of ended last week talking about David and Goliath, the wonderful story that we've, you know, all been told since we were little kids. And the amount of faith that David had as a young man running out to take on Goliath. And so in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 18, it says this. It says, someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. In other words, my faith and my trust in God is going to be evident by my words and my lifestyle and my actions. It's going to be evident. And it's so funny because so many people are, you know, kind of afraid to even talk about faith. You know, my wife just kind of, you know, uh, hit on it a little bit. We think it's, it's kind of like selfish or arrogant to try and build up our faith or try and do something amazing for God. But I'm telling you, the Bible talks a lot about faith. The Bible talks about little faith, weak faith, strong faith, abiding faith, bold faith, rich faith, obedient faith, steadfast faith, dead faith, precious faith. Those are just a few examples. But I want to talk to you today about faith in action. Well, really, faith is action, so it's kind of like a, <laughs> a little twist on it right there, because really, faith without action isn't real faith. It's not. If you really believe something, it'll change the way you live, the way you act, the way you talk. It changes everything. And so if we truly have a faith in Christ, there will be actions that follow. That's why David, as a young man, could run out and say, I don't know what's wrong with all of you while you're trembling in your boots. Do you not know how big God is? I don't need your armor. I don't need any of this stuff. I have faith in God. I killed a lion. I killed a bear. You guys are being a bunch of wimps, and we serve a big God. Finally, to the point where Saul's like, wow, go, go get it done then. <laughs> You've got more faith than me. And he goes out, and he conquers the giant. You see, there was faith in action. It wasn't just an idea. And so many of us think that faith is passive. It's just like a, an idea or a belief system. If I just believe long enough, if I just hope long enough, that's the starting point. But if it's real faith, if there's actually substance to it, there will be actions that follow. Amen. Here's what it says in the book of James. I want to I continue past verse 18. In verse 19, it says, all right, well, you believe that there's one God. Well, good, even the demons believe that and shudder. <laughs> in other words, great, you say you believe it. You say you believe in God. Really? That's, that, that, that's it? Even the demons believe in God. And they shudder. <laughs> Verse 20, you foolish person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Yeah. True faith has actions. His faith was made complete by what he did. It made no sense. God gave him and Sarah a son, in, in their old age, and this was supposed to be the son of the promise, and the whole world was going to be blessed through his son, and then now he's supposed to take his son and kill him? It makes no sense. You know, I don't want the number one reasons why, to me, it, makes no, it would have made no sense. It just goes against God's character, too. That, that's not part of God's character or nature to say, just go ahead and sacrifice your son to me. That's not what God asks of people, right? Let alone the fact that this is the promise. But he so confidently walked out in his trust in God that he was like, all right. Verse 23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. 
You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. You cannot demonstrate that you have faith unless you have some works. Because faith is invisible. It's an idea. It's a concept. It's where you're trying to put your heart or, or, or your mind. But when it's true faith, when it's complete, you'll walk out in it. And you'll begin to live like what you believe is true. You'll begin to live like what you believe can actually happen. Again, it's active faith. It's not faith or works. And it's so funny because... There's a lot of people who go, well, stop talking about what you're supposed to do. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not by works, lest anyone should boast. Well, I know. I understand that. And I hope you guys understand this. The reason why we do things is because we have faith and belief in God. Not because we have to. It's because we love God so much we want to be obedient. And we know that if we walk out in obedience and do what he asks us to do, we will please his heart and we'll, we will reap the benefit of obedience. So it's not, is it faith or is it works? No, it goes together. But we always want to separate it. And one of the biggest reasons why we want to separate is because it's easier to say, well, I don't want to fall into works. I don't want to have to, you know, fall into that rhythm. Really, what you're saying is I don't want to do anything. I'd rather just believe that God's going to do everything and it's on God. If it doesn't happen, God must have not wanted it to happen. There really is people who believe that. What kind of prayer life would you have? Or what would you even pray, I guess would be a better way to put it, if you don't believe that there's power in your prayers? You know, Jesus told his disciples, man, all power and authority has been given, now go. And actually, just prior to that, he said, pray, you know, that God would send out laborers and people into the field. And then he said, all right, okay, now you prayed, now go. <laughs> You've exercised your faith, now go. Yeah, go add some action steps to your faith. So, I was thinking about this concept yesterday because we were in Great Falls at my son's uh, soccer tournament. And... Uh, we happened to get a new car, a little Subaru Forester. And um, I'm a little bit of a control freak when it comes to driving. I don't know if there's any guys in here like that, you know. Um, it's not just my wife's driving that might be part of it, but um, she's just so distracted. She just loves everything. Everybody look out the window. Look, look. It's, I'm like, put your hands on the wheel, right? It's so beautiful. We've never driven to Great Falls at 5 o'clock. Look at the sunset. I mean, it, I mean, it's just beautiful. Sun so wasn't setting at 5. It was starting to, but anyway. So we, we get this new car. Well, this new car has something called Subaru EyeSight. It's the craziest thing. It's the crazy, here, I, I wrote down how they advertise it. It's like a second pair of eyes on the road ahead. EyeSight monitors your traffic movement. It optimizes cruise control, and it warns you when you're swaying outside of your lane. The pre-collision braking, it brakes for you. Feature can even apply full braking force, bringing you to a complete stop in emergency situations. It's another way Subaru designs vehicles with your safety in mind. So my wife sets the cruise, and she's like, this is awesome. Look, I take my hands off the steering wheel. It, it keeps you in the lanes, right? It's got this, like, active cruise control, so it slows you down as cars come and speeds you up. And, you know, it does all this stuff. But it was so crazy because on the way there, I drove, and I was fighting this thing the whole time. Because it wanted to be like this close to the line on the right, and I wanted to be in the center. And I'm like, I'm driving like this. And I'm like, who's driving this car? Me or you? <laughs> like, and it was like, finally, I just had enough of it, and I had to turn the silly thing off. But here's what's so interesting. My wife had no problem putting her complete faith and trust in Subaru EyeSight. We're driving home. All of a sudden, she's like, oh, the kids are sleeping. Selfie. She's taking a selfie while we're driving down the highway. 
I'm like, okay, babe, that's, that's not what this is designed for. You know, the little dash thing goes, beep, beep, put your hands on the wheel, you know, put your hands on the wheel. I'm like, come on, <laughs> that is not how we're supposed to do this. But I was thinking about this concept because ultimately, serving God or faith in action really is a lot like Subaru eyesight. We fight it. We say we like it, we say we want it, but we get tired of trying to hang on because God's trying to take us in a direction or put us in a spot where we're not comfortable. I wasn't comfortable being that close to the sideline. I wasn't comfortable with somebody else controlling my speed. I was like, man, we came up on that car so fast and now it seems like we're, oh yeah, it's adaptive cruise control. I'm like, it's slowing me down. I don't want to slow down, right? And so we fight it and finally we're just, I'm done. And that's what I did. I turned it off. Well, my wife was like, man, we got this car. I love it. She's just little Miss Faith woman. She's like, hey, I'm, you know, but that kind of shows you the difference. But ultimately, as believers, our faith and our trust in God should be so precise and so tuned in that we're like, okay, God, you got this. I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to trust the path and the road that you're going to take me down. I believe the destination is going to be in line with your plan and your well. And even if I'm uncomfortable, even if I don't like how close I am to this or to that, I'm going to trust you. That's what it truly means to live a life of faith. Now, I will say this. When it was on at one time, I tried to be like my wife. And I took my hands off. And no joke, all of a sudden, it made a sharp right turn on a straight road. Freaked me out. That's when I turned it off. But, you know, I, I, will, I will give it a little bit of a... <laughs> the sun was coming down, it had just rained, and you couldn't see any of the lines on the road. So I think it suddenly saw something off on the shoulder that it thought was the line, and, <laughs> and I, like, grabbed the steering wheel. So, yeah, keep your hands on the steering wheel in the natural. But spiritually speaking... <laughs> Quit fighting it. Here's what it says in Hebrews 11:6. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you just take that portion of that verse, it would be so practical if on a regular basis we were saying, okay, if I can't even please God without faith, then what am I currently in faith for? What am I currently praying about? What am I currently believing God to do? What has God asked me to do that I need his strength and his power and his anointing to do that I'm connected and engaged and believing for? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So obviously, we need to be in faith. Most believers, if I walked up to them and I said, hey, what are you currently in faith for? They'd be like, what? What do you mean, what am I in faith for? What are you believing God for? In other words, what has God asked you to do? What does God want you to do? Where is he asking you to go that you are trusting and believing for the provision, the open door, the way, the, you know, the strength, the finances, whatever it is, to walk out in obedience to him? There should be something that we are in faith for because it's faith that pleases God. I'm going to rattle a couple of scriptures off for you real quick here. I'm already talking fast, but I'm going to talk a little faster. Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When I was thinking of that verse, the substance, do you want the substance to me? This is just me. It, it doesn't say, now faith is some crazy old idea that's just, just out there and, and you're just hoping and believing, you know, like in Santa Claus or something. No, faith is the substance. So what happens is this. When you truly exercise your initial faith and ask God to do something, and he answers that prayer, suddenly you realize, wait a minute, God is true. He's real. He answers prayer. I've got some substance. So now I can ask again. There's some substance, some substance to my faith. I'm, I've seen and I've understood that God is real and he's true and there's evidence. Now it says evidence of things not seen. You don't see it, but you have seen it. And the more you have seen it, the more faith you'll have. Right. So at some point you make the decision. For me, it's making Jesus the Lord of my life. That was the first thing. I saw this change. There was 
substance to it. I asked Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior, and suddenly things changed. My thinking changed, my attitude changed, my life changed. So that made me realize that God is true and he's real. So then I started engaging my faith in God. I'm like, okay, God, you really are true. Romans 12, 3. It says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So he gives us like the seedling of faith, which to me is the ability to believe in him and come to him. But then we've got to grow and develop that. 2 Thessalonians 1.3, it says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. Oh, we're supposed to grow our faith? We're supposed to have more faith? I thought it was just like get into heaven faith. <laughs> no, God wants to do something in your life. He wants to do something in, you know, in your family, in your neighborhood. You got to grow this stuff. Romans 14, 23. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat. And this is where he's talking about, you know, there's some Christians who eat this stuff that's, and others who don't, and they're getting this whole thing. And finally, he just at the end says, okay, listen. Everything that does not come from faith is sin. <laughs> it's like, what? Well, that, that, that's a pretty straight out there statement. He's going, okay, anytime that you're not truly trusting God as your source, as your direction, as, as your everything, that that's actually sin because then you're trusting yourself. You're trusting your own abilities. You're trusting other people. You, you're making idols out of yourself and others instead of truly trusting in God. Hebrews 10, 38, but my righteous one will live by faith and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Now there's just a few verses. I can't even begin to cover faith today. I really can't. But when, I, when I'm doing a series on no limits, there's got to be this point where we begin to engage our trust in God and believe that he wants to do something more in and through our lives. In Matthew chapter 15, there, there, there's the story of a, a Canaanite woman. And she comes to Jesus because her, her daughter's demon-possessed. But she, she doesn't just come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus. She actually can't even get to Jesus at first. The disciples are holding her back. And they're like, they're so put out with her because she's relentless. She is. She wants to get to Jesus. Jesus, you got to do something for my daughter. You got to set my... And she is just to the point where they're like, Jesus, can we just like get rid of her? I don't think that means, you know, like... It just meant like, we just want to like get her out of the way. I'm tired of listening to this woman. And finally, she finds Jesus and gets down on her knees. And she's like, please, you've got to heal my daughter. And in Matthew 15, verse 28, Jesus says to her, woman... You have great faith. You have great faith. In other words, you were relentless and you were willing to pursue and you believed that I was able to fill that need that you had. And you went after it. That's amazing to me. But now if you, if you look in Mark chapter 4, we got a bunch of disciples. And verse 35, it says, That day when evening came, he's talking to his disciples and he and they're like, hey, uh, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So leaving the crowd behind, they took Jesus along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with them. All of a sudden, this furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. In other words, he's not getting rocked by what's going on around him. The disciples wake up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? So here you've got disciples with no faith, and you got this woman who just has a possessed daughter with great faith. Where are you on the spectrum? Where are you? Where am I? I have to keep asking myself this because I know faith is what pleases God. Living a life of faith is what pleases him. I ask myself pretty consistently how much of what I am doing right now currently is requiring faith and trust in God and how much am I just doing because I can do it and I know I can do it. 
Is it my own abilities or am I trusting God or really do I need God to really do it? I got my marriage. I got parenting down. I got ministry down. I don't. I need God. I need God big time. So my faith and my trust is in him. So we've got to make sure that we are in pursuit of him. So I'm going to give you really quick three quick things that will hit, help to activate your faith. Here's the first one. You got to understand that hearing activates faith. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now here's what you got to understand in this verse. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's not talking about the, the logos, the written word. That's talking about the rhema, the spoken word. So in other words, faith comes, your faith is activated when you hear from God. When God speaks to you, it does something. Wait a minute, God just asked me to go and do this. God just called me to go on the mission field. God just told me to go to that store and minister to that person. God just asked me to go and bless my neighbor. When you hear from God, it activates your faith. Because, you know, I've had all kinds of people tell me stuff I should do. But let me tell you something. When, when I sense in my spirit, when I hear in my heart that God is nudging me or directing me in a direction, that's something totally different. Quit your job, move here, do this, sell this, buy this, go. Um, when I hear that, it activates my faith. I'm like, all right, I'm on the move. God's asked me to do something. I'm going to go. This is awesome, right? So Luke chapter 5, verse 5, and this is, this is Peter. He's been fishing all day. He's exhausted. He's done everything he knows to in the natural as a fisherman, and he's got nothing. It says, but Peter answered and says to him, Master, we've toiled all night and we've caught nothing. In other words, he just pulled the boat in. He's exhausted, trying to do it on his own. And there's Jesus. And he goes, nevertheless, at your word, I'll let, I'll, I'll let down the net. In other words, but if you tell me to do it again, if you tell me to go out and give it one more shot, if you give me the word, Jesus, I'll do it. Well, the only way that you're going to hear from God that way is the same way that Peter just heard from God. He had a face-to-face -face connect. He had an encounter. Look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 7, 12. It says, By faith Noah, when he was warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear he built an ark. Why did he build an ark? He heard from God. Right? By faith Abraham, when he was called to go to a place, he would later receive his inheritance. He obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. That's confusing, but... It's faith. He heard from God. I'm going to go. I don't know specifically, but I know the general direction God's calling me to. Do you want know how much of my life I have found out on the fly? <laughs> Just as you go. The steps of the righteous are ordained by the Lord. God tells me to take this step, and I take that step. One step leads to the next step, and next thing you know, you're like, man, I love what God is doing around me. I never would have got here unless I would have listened to God and taken that first step. So we've got to make sure that we are listening to him. So the first thing is you've got to hear from God, and you're only going to hear from God if you spend time with him. All right? So hearing will activate your faith. The second thing is compassion will activate your faith. In Matthew chapter 8, we have the faith of the centurion. So the centurion comes to Jesus, and he says, Lord, my servant lies at home. He's paralyzed. He's suffering terribly. Jesus says to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replies, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself, I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. So here's what was happening with the centurion. He knew someone who had a need, and he knew Jesus was the answer. Need, answer. Compassion moves him with faith to go find Jesus so that his servant would be healed. It's amazing what compassion does. When God moves your heart to help somebody to do something, you will start believing for incredible things. You know, there's this awesome ministry called Compassion International. I, I, I got a picture of their uh, website up here. But Compassion International was started by Dick Larson. Good old Montana boy 
that God spoke to his heart. And when he began to see what was going on in different places around the world, he was moved with compassion and said, I can do something about this. I can do something. And so he began to believe God for things. He believed God for favor with, with medical equipment. And suddenly he started getting all this medical equipment. He believed God for food. He believed God for clothing. And he would go all over the world. And now Lance Landing is heading it up. You know, we got people in our church who are a key part of it. We support this ministry. But it all started with compassion. There's people around the world who have needs. God, use me to help meet those needs. And so they, they do all kinds of, they, they do shoes, they do medical, they build houses, they do food, they do wish, mission trips, they do water wells. Do you realize that most of the incredible things that get done around this world by believers is because those believers have spent time with God, they hear from God, and then they're moved with compassion. And that compassion says, okay, God, I know that you want to minister to those people. And I believe that if you put it on my heart, you're going to use me. So then they start exercising their faith. God, make a way. God, make a way for me to bring water over, you know, water wells, to build houses, to do whatever it is. But you got to have God's heart of compassion. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, Christ's love, it compels us. If you are truly full of the love of God, Faith in action, you'll be compelled. Yeah, true. You'll be compelled. Not just sympathy, but compassion, where you're willing to actually do something. I believe there's some people sitting in this room that God wants to use to do something so much bigger than where you're currently at. And if your heart gets stirred sometimes, if you're watching the news or, or you hear about something and you're like, man, I wish I could do something. That's the compassion of God. Let that motivate you and stir you to begin to engage God and step out in faith and do something. It's amazing what God does when we take that step of faith. Be moved with compassion because compassion activates faith. And finally, spiritual fervor activates faith. Now, these are kind of all tied together, but Romans 12, verses 9 through 11 says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. So here's what happens. When you continue to press into the things of God, when you continue to allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in you, when you're in the Word, when you're in His presence, when you're a worshiper, when, when, when you're actively engaged, then what happens is you begin to live a life of faith. You know, you wouldn't know what God's promises are to stand on if you didn't read them. But you suddenly read this, and you're like, oh my goodness, I got a hunger for His Word, and I see what it says. Wait a minute. Okay, God, I want to do something now. You see, it stirs something in you. But if you don't begin to or continue to develop your, your spiritual disciplines, then nothing's going to happen. It's not that you have to do anything. It's you want to. And the more you grow and the more you pray, the more you'll be stirred to believe God for incredible things. <laughs> Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 through 19 says this, and I want to go back to, to Abraham for a second. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, he offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Okay, he embraced the promises. <laughs> his fervor for walking in obedience to God surpassed anything in the natural, including his own understanding of things. He was so connected with God, so in tune that he's like, God, I don't understand this, but I want to please you. His passion became his love for God. In verse 18, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. 19, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. He's going, all right, I do not understand this. God, you're going to have to raise him back then because you, you've promised that, you know, that, 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 that's where the promise is going to come is through my son. I don't understand everything I'm seeing in the natural. But God, my spiritual fervor and love for you is more important than anything. And that's what caused him to take that step of faith and walk out in obedience to God. 
if you don't have that spiritual foundation of connection with God, you are constantly going to be limited by what you see, what you feel, what you sense, what people tell you. It's amazing how many haters we have out there. Even in, even in the church. People don't really like when someone else takes a step of faith because then they feel like they aren't very spiritual. Man, you're doing all that for God. Stop it. You're making me look bad. You know, we, we start critiquing other churches who are doing amazing things and finding out all the reasons why it's bad or wrong. Spending too much money here, doing this, doing that. Really? Why don't you just walk out in obedience? Why don't we just walk out in obedience? Why don't we get so stirred up that we're not moved by the natural, we're moved by the Spirit? Because that's what happens when you uh, get all stirred up. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We live by faith and not by sight. So really, I feel like what God wants to kind of wrap this whole series up with is just simply the challenge of it's time for us to have faith in God. Yes. True faith. Faith that has actions. When we read it, when we hear it, when we understand it, we make the decision, God, I'm going to walk this out. I believe there's some of us in here where God has even spoken to you, whether it be about your marriage, about your kids, about a ministry, and you've, you've thought of all the reasons why nothing can change, of all, all the reasons why it won't happen, instead of just having faith in God. Just have faith in God. I'll close with this scripture. Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 24. Have faith in God. <laughs> really? That's your whole message. Yes. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Now I hate that I always have to put disclaimers on stuff. Because we're so self-focused, and again, we want to find all the reasons why we can't or shouldn't do stuff. But I just read that verse that says, If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it'll be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And some of you immediately went, no, nah, that's too extreme. That's, that's too selfish. God wants us to take the lid off. No limits. If it's in his word, if it's in his plan, if it's in his will, then it's time that we say, okay, God, I said I'm taking the lid off. No more limits. I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm going to get so far out of my comfort zone that I'm going to be forced to rely on your strength in your anointing, in your provision. Like we just love our little American culture comfort zones, don't we? This is it. This is my world. This is my business. This is me and my family. I'm comfortable. And God's saying, come on, have faith in me. Have faith in me. There's things I want to do. You don't believe God can absolutely rock Afghanistan? Do you guys realize that Sean Foyt, who was just here a couple weeks ago leading worship in Little Billings, Montana, has led worship in Afghanistan? Because God spoke to him. And he's gone places where Christians are persecuted and killed. And he's gone and boldly proclaimed the word of God and brought worship and revival. And he's lived to tell it. Because he has faith in God. He's not limiting what it is that God can and will do in his life or in his family's life. And I'm just kind of tired of living with limits. I really am. I'm tired of fighting everything. God's trying to get me to go somewhere and I'm kind of enjoying the ride, but I'm still kind of like fighting. Like, no, like God, really? I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that one thing. I don't want to have to. And it's like, 
there's just, there's just a point where we got to just say, okay, God, I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever it is that you want to do. I'm going to tune my spiritual ears into your voice because he promised that as his children, we're going to hear. And God, I'm going to begin to activate my faith. I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to walk it out. I'm going to walk it out. I have laid hands on so many people for healing. And a whole bunch of them haven't been healed. I've laid hands on people for healing. Some of them got healed. I've laid hands on people for healing. A couple of times it was miraculous, instantaneous. Guess what? I'm not responsible for the outcome. That's not on me. I'm responsible for obedience. I got to do whatever it is that God's asked me to do. And I'm going to keep doing it. And whatever he says, that's what I'm going to do. It doesn't matter what people think. That's irrelevant. I want to walk out in obedience to God. I want to take the lid off. 